Uh, this next topic is about uh, outreach in the wake of a pandemic. And as we're aware, outreach is a key part of uh, any transportation project and implementation. And uh, during COVID, a lot of us have had to pivot to uh, conduct our outreach in a virtual way. Even, you know, the fact that we're here in a virtual conference is reflective of the, the climate and the environment that we have to work in. And so I'm really excited to host um, this panel and talk to these participants uh, about virtual outreach and in-person outreach in the case of Cupertino. So um, our panel today uh, consists of Seema Linskog from uh, Walk by Cupertino, uh, Jennifer Sheeran, also from Walk by Cupertino, Erica Rincon, a, a community health planner with Get Healthy San Mateo County, and um, Eduardo or Lalo Gonzalez. And so just to quickly introduce uh, these panelists, Seema, as I mentioned, is a member of uh, the board of Walk by Cupertino. She's an entrepreneur and former marketing executive, and she's been a Cupertino resident for 15 years. Uh, she's actually a Safe Routes to School parent uh, for Lawson Middle School, where one of her kids goes to school. And she's passionate about making Cupertino more livable, friendly, and vi vibrant. Jennifer Sheeran is uh, also a Cupertino resident and is uh, was formerly an engineer for General Motors. She's a Girl Scout leader, a Cupertino High PTSA board member, and an active member of the Safe Routes to School. Uh, she's on her treacherous governing board and previously was the event chair for Cupertino Tournament of Bands for two years. And she's got three kids, one of which walks to Cupertino High or did walk to Cupertino High when it was open. Erica Rincon, again, with uh, Get Healthy San Mateo County, uh, with a focus in workforce development and transportation justice. Uh, Erica's got over 10 years of experience. Uh, working to advance equity and access to opportunity for low-income people of color throughout the state of California. Uh, and Lalo is a program manager at the Youth Leadership Institute, or YLI, in San Mateo County. Uh, he's got over six years of experience in youth and peer engagement and advocacy projects. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get started, um, and then we'll do a few questions at the end. So... Jen and Seema, you want to kick it off? Sure. Uh, do you have our slides up? Okay. Um, there, we, uh, there we go. Um, so we're going to be doing this together. So Jennifer and I are going to be going back and forth. Um, and uh, I'll let Jennifer kick it off. Um, but hopefully the format works for everyone. We will ask you guys to, um, to, we'll say next slide. And if you someone could advance the slides for us, that would work really well. All set? Great. OK, next slide, please. So these are the um, items that we're going to be talking about today. Good morning. Uh, this is an introduction to all the information that we're going to give you today. There's nine primary steps to mobilizing your community, which will take you from the project inception to just before the construction starts. Okay, next slide. All right, so the first thing you have to do uh, when you are creating a project like this is um, it's critical to take the time to identify the right person to lead the project as this will determine its long-term success. Sometimes the right person is two people, um, like in our case. Um, in two for us was the magic number. We complemented each other's strengths. Two people also have more combined time to devote to the project and keep each other motivated through the inevitable ups and downs. Next slide. Um, think of the outreach that you're going to do on your project as a series of concentric circles from the, uh, the most amount of time you're going to devote to the innermost circle down out to the, the less, uh, less amount of time that you're going to need to devote to the further out circles. So your core team is your inner circle. It's 10 to 20 people that you know well personally. Um, there are people that you can rely on to call, send emails, show up, and encourage others to sign up uh, to be supporters for your project. Um, for this group, you need to use frequent one-on-one -on -one communication to keep them engaged. Um, know what works best for each person, be it in-person get-togethers, phone calls, texts, emails, or a combination of all of those. Um, and as you can see from the diagram, it can be all kinds of people, all ages, occupations. Next slide, please. Once you get that core team of supporters, it's important then to work with those 
will be deciding on whether to build your project and how it will be built. There's always options to build something with more features or less enhancements. Consistent and regular communication is important. It's easy for those decision makers to leave you out of the loop. Most importantly, always use as a foundation facts and logic. Frequently, opposition is based on emotions and fears, and having facts and sound reasoning backing up your points makes you much more likely to be accepted as credible. Next slide. It's essential to reach out as soon as you can for endorsements from all local groups that might support the project. This shows not only the depth and breadth of support, but also shows all the different uh, organizations that would be able to support you. Here are some of the organizations that we approached for endorsements. Some of the more obvious endorsements are towards the top where you see the, the, um, the ice and then less of the less obvious endorsements are near the bottom. You should think of both of them. Next slide. The next slide. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, okay, so the, the, the critical thing also is building a mailing list. Um, the strength of your mailing list is critical to your success. Um, your goal is to first get people into your mailing list and then you can deepen your relationship with them. One good way to build a mailing list is to start a petition focused on an easy to communicate message that resonates quickly with the person who's listening to you. You want to make it a really no brainer for residents to sign up while staying, you know, factual. Uh, build as big a list as you possibly can. In this case, bigger is definitely better. Um, the most efficient way to reach residents is to go to them where and when they are in greatest density. So for us, for example, it was places like the library on the weekends or parks in the evening or street fairs. Um, you also need to leverage your partner's mailing lists to reach a broader but still very targeted audience. So for example, local bike shops. Next slide, please. Once the supporters are in your mailing list, your goal is to move them down the funnel from being interested residents who signed your petition to occasional advocates to passionate advocates. Use frequent relevant communication through a variety of different channels. Make sure you let supporters know quickly about any developments so they hear it from you first and get your analysis of the implications. Keep communication as fact-based and objective as you can so you become a trusted source. And this is really, really important, especially because in cases like this, often the objections are more emotion and fear-based. So it's important for you to stay factual. Um, it's important to also organize social occasions for the residents to get to know each other and coalesce as a group. Start with easy asks, such as sending emails in support of the project using pre-addressed email links with suggested content. If you don't know how to do that, we can tell you privately after this, then work your way up to bigger asks like helping to gather petition signatures, um, showing up to support at city meetings without talking, and then eventually speaking at city meetings. Create lists of supporters based on the type of support they're able to provide so that you can mobilize them quickly depending on what is needed. Um, Jennifer and I had, I think, dozens of spreadsheets of, of details of, you know, the types of residents and what they could do. Um, there are the ones who can write great articulate emails quickly, can attend in person, the ones who can email and come speak at meetings, the ones who can attend but prefer not to speak, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next slide. Before a vote, have two to three people come to speak or email the council before each council meeting. When the project goes up for the actual vote at city council or the deciding body, vocal support mobilization should move it into a much higher gear reach out to everyone we've talked about before to ask them to come and speak or email if they can't. You should have a very large email list by now. Don't worry if you get a low percentage to come and speak. That's why you've reached out to so many people. Encourage the speakers at all the meetings to talk about the different reasons that there's for their support of the project. Some ideas for this are local residents that would use the project and the benefits to them for recreation and encouragement of sustainable transportation benefits to the city and value for the money, benefits to local businesses. Um, as we know, people who ride your bike through the community spend more money at local businesses. Benefits to school children, including safety, recreation, and encouragement of active commuting. Don't forget to, incur to include their parents. Getting residents to speak that have had a project like this one built near them is very helpful, especially if they were against their project at first and now like it. Lastly, show the wide support the project has by presenting your petition names, not with personal information, just the names, 
and all your endorsements that you've already received. At the meeting, make it less stressful for your speakers. Provide speakers with talking points and research data so that it is easier for them to speak. Be organized, bring snacks, the meetings can be long, and provide stickers at the meeting so that those that don't feel comfortable speaking can still show support. Afterward, thank them and let them know how the vote turned out. Next slide. The more speakers at city council meetings, the more visible the support. This is incredibly important. Show the depth and breadth of support, especially among residents of all ages, including students. And you can see all the students that were, were at our, one of our meetings. It's not uncommon that opposition is, is longtime retired residents show that the project looks towards the future. There's lots of meetings where this project may be discussed, including school board meetings, water board meetings, and city hall, town, town hall type meetings. Have a presence at all of them. We know that not everyone can attend meetings. Encourage sending as many emails as possible, even from those planning to attend a meeting, to show the community support. As we mentioned, make it easy for everyone with online tools to fill in email addresses and suggested content. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so finally, be vigilant. It's very important. Project approval and construction is a long drawn out multi-year process that involves a lot of constituents. Objections can come at any time from angles you really didn't anticipate. Um, they can come in a variety of different ways, such as attempts to increase the cost of the project to make it unviable, or challenging its environmental impact, um, or more. You have to stay alert for any happenings that could be used to derail your project. Stay connected with your supporters with fun, useful content so that they're engaged and they're available when you send out a call to action and they're ready to mobilize quickly, if and when it's needed. Um, next slide. This in a nutshell is how to mobilize a community, uh, a very quick <laughs> summary to get a project approved even in the face of significant opposition. Pick the right champion, build a core team, stay fact-based and trustworthy, stay connected with decision makers and influencers, build a large community of motivated supporters, mobilize them to action and stay vigilant. Please feel free to reach out to either of us to discuss any of these steps in more detail. We're gonna hold off for questions right now, but we look forward to hearing them later in this session. Thanks. Thanks, Jen and Seema. Uh, yeah, drop your, your questions in the chat. Uh, we're gonna to move to the next presentation um, about youth engagement. Great, um, thank you. Hi everyone, again, my name is Lalo Gonzalez. I'm with the Youth Leadership Institute. Um, can we get the next slide, please? So we're a statewide nonprofit partnering with youth to create more equitable and healthy communities. We have offices across California, as you can see on this map. Um, and today that we'll be focusing on efforts that are happening specifically in San Mateo County. Um, in San Mateo County, we have a diverse set of programs that range from alcohol, tobacco, and other prevention work to advocating for more equitable and sustainable public transportation system. All these efforts strive towards increasing youth leaders through civic engagement processes. And today I'm going to be focusing on sharing our work and what it has looked like in, in the county, but also specifically in Half Moon Bay. Next slide, please. Um, before that, just a little bit more about why I lie. We leave with these four values in mind um, that are very important when it comes to community engagement. So the first one is inclusion. Um, we know that young people are profoundly impacted by policies that are affecting their communities. So we always aim to bring youth to the table and work to institutionalize youth voice in the decision making process. The second is innovation. Youth can often see a way forward where adults cannot due to their fresh perspectives and ideas. Wildlife's youth development strategy encourages youth to identify and implement their own solutions um, to the issues their communities are facing. Third is social justice. Throughout history, young people have ignited and led social justice movements to create a better world for everyone. Wildlife helps them to focus their attention on the root causes of injustices and sharpen the skills they need to tackle them. And lastly, community. Nobody can get any of this work done alone. So through relationship and coalition building, wildlife feeds the connective tissue within our communities to build power um, our movements, sorry, to within our communities to power our movements with the brilliance, resourcefulness, and wisdom of our partners. Next slide, please. So we use this three-step model to identify these issues and solutions in our work. Um, our first is youth leadership development and capacity building. Young people um, need to feel empowered to be able to lean in to their experiences and expertise. 
This looks like developing public speaking skills, providing historical context to issues they are working on, and building a sense of empowerment in their own identities. So, um, once we have that base, we move to fill in the blanks to create data-driven change. Um, we take youth through a process of youth-led action research where they have the opportunity to develop the methodology, research questions, implementations, and then go through a process of analyzing the data to create findings and recommendations. Um, the research does not stop there. Um, we then identify next steps to create some movement um, or change with this data. And that leads me to the third part of our process, which is a community campaign. We do not just want to create data to have it stored, but want to make sure that decision makers, um, administrators, and community is aware um, of what we are producing to push for action to happen. This action can look like pushing for a policy in their local communities or creating a school or community campaign. So whatever young people decide is best for them. Next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about Team C, um, it stands for Transportation Equity Allied Movement Coalition. Um, the Team C um, started with two youth groups that were funded by Get Healthy San Mateo County. One of the youth groups was in semi-urban South San Francisco, where there's access to BART, Caltrain, Samtrans, and the ferry. The second youth group took place in Half Moon Bay, where it's, a, where it's more of a semi-rural community in the coastline of San Mateo. Um, and also where bus is really their only um, reliable um, transportation system. Even Uber and Lyft are not really there because it's so isolated in the coast. Um, we looked at public transportation because we know that it connects people to places and it is a major determinant of access to opportunity and economic mobility as well as um, health outcomes. So keeping this in mind, we brought together about 20 youth from both cities to go through a youth-led action research project and learn more about the barriers and recommendations to increase youth transit ridership. And both communities found that the issue that, um, the issue that they found was that bus was unreliable and in general public transportation was unreliable and not efficient to get people around where they need to be. Through this research and group that project, we were able to bring then um, together about 20 different organizations working to advance transportation solutions that promote social equity, public health and safety, and environmental protection in San Mateo County. The coalition along with the youth um, was then able to push for a ballot measure, Measure W, that included equity principles as a way to center the needs of transit dependent riders, which are low income people of color. Because we know that um, ballot measures are impact low income communities of color the most. So we wanted to make sure that they were also benefiting from this. Next slide, please. Now, um, to talk a little bit more about the work that was done with the youth in Half Moon Bay, as I mentioned earlier, um, youth collected and continued to collect data on youth transportation experiences. We learned that safety is a big issue youth want to address. Safety on the bus, um, but also getting to the bus. So having safe crossing streets, um, complete sidewalks where they can walk and bike, um, and that way they're able to access their, their bus stops more, more safely. Youth had an opportunity to engage their peers and ask for feedback on, city, on a city's priorities project. So transportation was a top priority for the city and youth agreed making this, um, making transportation number two on their top list. Um, we heard that tourism on weekends and where um, there's, there's um, only limited ways out of the city caused frustration for local residents. For civic engagement, Youth also had the opportunity to share their thoughts and learnings in a few city council meetings before the pandemic hit and are also planning to engage city council in the next couple of months to uplift youth experiences. And lastly, for Connect the Coast, youth are currently engaging with this project through the San Mateo County's Office of Sustainability to include unincorporated communities around the area that also deal with these transportation issues outside of city boundaries. Next slide, please. Um, so these quotes speak about um, why this issue is important to youth um, and, and quotes that we have collected through our research efforts. So the first quote reads, public transportation is important because it gives me and my friends a sense of independence. Since I am young, I cannot drive myself. However, by having access to public transportation, my friends and I have the opportunity to explore more on our own. The second quote reads, public transportation is important because it helps reduce traffic congestion. Daily traffic on the coastside has gotten worse. I would like the city of Half Moon Bay and Sam Trans to work together to get more bus routes in town. So this just shows um, that transportation is key for opportunities and young people are also aware about um, how beneficial public transportation can be in their communities. Next slide, please. So as we know, um, this pandemic has um, shifted a lot of our priorities and how we engage with youth. 
So part of that, um, what we did was start assessing and providing youth what their needs are. Um, so that's understanding, you know, who has access to Wi-Fi, who has a laptop and a desk space. And we partnered with community resources to provide some of that and also tapped into some of our funds to make sure that youth were able to continue to be engaged and successful, not only in our programs, but also more importantly in the remote, remote learning. Um, engagement looked like creating space for youth to share how they are doing. So mental health was a huge topic that we started to talk about more and our meetings became a space to vent and process everything that was going on. Um, our meetings were ultimately becoming the space to continue to build community and connect with each other virtually. And lastly, we had, the, we had to be intentional about revisiting the work that they wanted to do. We understood if they wanted to take a break, that was okay, but some of the youth um, really wanted to continue this kind of work. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to end with this quote because it just shows how, uh, how powerful young people are and it's a reminder that the work does not stop and youth are looking forward to continue to advocate for positive change. So it reads, if they and they, um, it means the city council. So if city council are still working, then we should be, we should still be working to represent our community. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Lalo. Uh, let's uh, transition to Erica's presentation. Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Erica Rincon. Um, as mentioned, I'm a community health planner with Get Healthy San Mateo County. Just wanted to provide a quick overview of our organization. Our mission is to support policy change to prevent diseases and ensure everyone has equitable opportunities to live a long and healthy life. Uh, we are a collaborative that is housed at the San Mateo County Health Department and we work across multiple disciplines and partnerships. Um, working with community-based organizations, schools, cities, hospitals, leaders, and we engage in local planning and policy making, research and capacity building. And our framework is really threefold. Um, we are focused on health equity, so acknowledging that uh, folks of color and low-income people face worse health outcomes, and so we're trying to reduce these health disparities in San Mateo County. Again, we very much believe in collaboration as an important uh, part of the work that we do and our work is is focused on place based prevention, recognizing that where we work, live and play profoundly shapes our health outcomes. And um, next slide. Great. Thanks. Um, our framework um, on community engagement is really focused on, um, you know, supporting meaningful participation of, of um, all residents, um, including low-income people, people of color, and folks who have historically um, not been involved in local decision-making. We very much value um, the expertise of our local residents. And then just finally, um, we really support reaching out to communities um, prior to any development of, plan, of a plan, policy, or program to really understand what the needs and the priorities are and what are the solutions that folks um, are offering up prior to even drafting it so that you're not going back to the community simply for feedback on something that's already been drafted. Um, there's so many benefits to implementing uh, community engagement. So I won't go through all of these uh, for the sake of time, but I do wanna just really lift up that, um, you know, uh, meaningful public participation really allows planners and policymakers and other folks to land at the most effective solution because it's designed by the community and that will ultimately lead to maximizing the outcomes and the benefits of our public resources. Now here I just want to highlight um, the connection between health and community engagement. This is obviously something that we think a lot about uh, being, you know, at the county health department. And so um, essentially what research is showing to us is that community engagement is good for our health because it, it supports folks in feeling more connected, which um, strengthens social networks. It helps to build community trust. And all of that increases our social capital. And social capital is what is associated with lower rates of heart disease, lower rates of depression, and it also serves to build resiliency against trauma. And in San Mateo County, oops, um, sorry, can we go back a couple slides? Just go back a couple of slides and then one more. Cool, thanks. Um, so in San Mateo County, this is particularly important to think about 
for youth. Um, so here's a slide that is showing an increasing trend of hospitalization for self-harm injury among youth in San Mateo County. And so some of this data is showing that youth are feeling more disconnected from their communities. This rate is higher than the statewide rate. Uh, next slide, please. And then here, this shows, this is data that shows an increasing rate of hospitalization for mental health issues affecting youth in the county. This is particularly high for youth ages 15 to 19. And again, the rate is higher in the county than the statewide rate. And so community gain, engagement actually offers one path to improving health outcomes among youth and addressing some of this feeling of being disconnected because it can help them, it, feel more connected to their communities and feel more empowered when they're engaged in local planning and policy making really uh, foster a sense of belonging which has been shown to have positive impacts on their self-esteem growth and identity during these formative years uh, next slide please Here I just want to highlight two kind of recent efforts in the in the field of transportation planning and funding, particularly active transportation and sustainable transportation. This is uh, going to be highlighted a bit more in the next sec uh, section on our session on equity. But just to acknowledge the Safe Rosso Schools National Partnership has now lifted up engagement as their first E, the priority E, or, or the top E in their five E's framework. We also have a new program that folks should be aware of in California, the Sustainable Transportation Equity Project. This is a pilot program providing funding for plans and for um, sustainable transportation projects uh, that is very much focused on community-led projects. So it's got probably the largest focus I've seen on community engagement in uh, transportation plans or transportation funding. Next slide. All right, so now I just wanna dive into um, a resource that we provide to planners, policymakers, and anyone who's interested in implementing community engagement processes. So I encourage you all to go to our website and to access this toolkit we have on community engagement. This provides um, a lot of information um, on all these best practices. Um, it includes a focus on inclusive and intentional engagement. It includes um, a focus on how you ensure your uh, community engagement process is transparent, how to build community trust, and also how to uh, really foster um, a sense of empowerment and building capacity among your residents. Uh, next slide. <coughs> Actually went over this, so yeah, next slide again. So I, I uh, now just want to focus specifically on our chapter on virtual engagement. Uh, this is something that we just added recently, given that we are in this pandemic and folks are, are only able to gather now online. So I, again, I encourage you to go to our toolkit. We have um, a whole checklist around how to implement virtual meetings and sort of every little piece to think about in order to make them accessible. Uh, I just wanted to lift up a couple of best practices now. Uh, so you want to really think about what are the different barriers people might have when accessing a virtual meeting. So this might be, you know, um, a language barrier. They need it to be translated. It could be folks who don't have access to broadband technology. It could be how do we make the meetings accessible for, pe for people with disabilities. So the key thing to think about is you um, you have to plan well in advance and it does take resources. So this is not something you want to just think about right before we list all these different sort of steps that you need to take and it does require pl advanced planning and and um, greater resources. You, um, you want to think about also how you're addressing barriers um, to technology. So not everyone has broadband. So not everyone can easily hop on to Zoom. Uh, so you want to think about how do we have uh, phone options? How do we make the presentation available to folks? You know, um, a you know, basically making a recorded presentation available. Um, you also want to think about working with community organizations that are actually working with residents to increase their access to technology. So there, you know, community groups that have been providing tablets and also providing trainings to folks on how to um, access technology. And then 
In terms of creating virtual meetings that are welcoming, that are inclusive, you want to be um, leading with cultural humility practices. A lot of this is focused on like diversifying your speakers, diversifying your content, make sure it's reflective of your audience. Um, you want to make sure that there's balanced participation of everyone. Like how do you foster that? How do you facilitate a meeting to ensure that not just one perspective is dominating the conversation? Um, and then also use language that promotes inclusion. So you're not reinforcing do uh, dominant norms around gender, around class, around immigration status, et cetera. Uh, next slide. And then in terms of visuals, so we know that, you know, charts and graphs and maps and all of this is really important to show, but we also have to know how do we design them to really be accessible, to not be overly complicated and to also be communicated in a manner that, again, folks with disabilities can, can easily understand the point that you're trying to communicate. So there's a lot of little things to think about when it comes to the actual design, and that's in our toolkit as well. Um, next slide. And then here are just some no contact methods for reaching out to communities. I see this more as, you know, sharing um, or a way to gather feedback from folks and a way to share information or to publicize your meetings. So for folks who are not always, you know, on city websites or the normal sort of uh, web outlets that you're using, these are other things to think about. You can do surveys. Um, there's a lot of folks are getting their information from actual like traditional media channels. Um, mailers and pamphlets actually still work, uh, mailing them to folks as residences. And then there's obviously robo messages. Um, okay, next slide. All right, and so that's the website for our toolkit. I encourage you to check that out. And then also uh, feel free to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter um, on the website listed there. And then you can also follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, uh, Lalo, Jen, and Seema. Uh, those were some really great discussions about uh, pre and post COVID interactions. And we've got uh, really good questions that have come through the chat, as well as a few questions that um, I thought would be good to just talk about um, as a whole. So I wanted to start by uh, asking you guys, how have your priorities shifted in light of shelter in place and you know, the way you look ahead to the next year or two, um, knowing that there's a possibility people are going to be sheltering for a little while longer. We can start with um, Lalo. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so for us, right when the pandemic hit, we really took a pause. Um, we really shifted our, our kind of like plan and work from <clears throat> trying to get projects done and the projects that young people had determined they wanted to complete to really understanding and assessing, you know, how how are they going to be interacting with school and with their community moving forward? So, like I mentioned, it was really um, doing a uh, needs assessment of like, you know, what from our young people that we are partnering with across the county, um, who are of our young people, you know, have access to these technologies that are now going to be like, be, like, you know, the key to a community engagement and to like connect with city council and other staff and other and also to each other. Um, and now, like looking forward, it's really. Um, it's really like, you know, revisiting that conversation around like mental health and we, you know, a lot of our, our focus is around transportation in Half Moon Bay, but we noticed that we had to start really talking about what mental health was and, you know, how to really talk about self care, um, because this is definitely a huge transition for everyone, especially young people that really depend on school as their community to interact with their peers. And now that's being taken away, I mean, they're being isolated in their homes, they don't really have that opportunity. So. Um, it really has meant, you know, being more flexible um, and being more open and, and you know, if, if young people show up to our weekly meeting and they're like, you know, today I'm not feeling it, we'll be like, okay, it's fine. Like, let's, let's have a conversation about, you know, how you're feeling, how your week has been, you know, let's, let's build community versus trying to keep on pushing this agenda. So overall, just more flexibility um, and just being, you know, being open to that kind of flexibility um, and also just continuing to depend on our community partners um, and our teachers. Um, and how we can you know, collaborate with them to really kind of like, um, you know, connect with, with more students um, virtually. Um, um, because traditionally we, we do like in-person outreach and in-person meetings. Um, so now it's really like looking at the systems that are in place through the public school 
um, public schools to really figure out like what's the best way to engage. Thanks. And so Jen and Seema, have you guys um, seen a shift in your priorities for Walk by Cupertino, um, just looking ahead to keeping people engaged in, in your organization and, and projects that you're interested in? Well, luckily, um, you know, we do have a, a very large mailing list at this point. Um, and so I think what we've been doing is, is utilizing that most of all. Um, such as through personal emails, newsletter updates, th things like that, making sure that we reach out to the community as much as possible in the channels that are available to us. Obviously, we can't do in-person events. Um, they've canceled Earth Day. They've canceled our bike fest for the fall. So, so those sorts of in-person activities aren't, aren't going on right now. But um, certainly everything electronically that we can, we can figure out, we're, we're definitely doing, including a WhatsApp group, um, just to keep everybody informed about what's happening. Um, as we mentioned during the chat, one, one benefit has been that um, we've seen that it's a little bit easier for some people to attend council meetings than they used to because they're able, they don't have to actually um, travel to the meeting. Our city council meetings tend to be extremely long. Um, the vote for our project last year, about a year ago, ran to 4.30 in the morning. So it was extremely late. And so a lot of people just can't do that. I mean, I mean there's just no way. So um, at least what we've seen is people are able to be in their house, go about their daily life activities and still participate. Um, obviously there's still concerns, I think as mentioned by Lalo and, uh, and Erica that, you know, people who don't have as much access to technology can have more trouble. But um, one thing that I'm seeing in some of my work elsewhere in the community is that it's surprising how many people who didn't feel comfortable with any of this stuff, you know, back in March, now are completely comfortable with it and really enjoy being able to, um, especially, you know, maybe some of our housebound seniors, being able to reach out and actually be in touch with people that they would never have been able to before. So it, it's, it actually has, has been working out fairly well for us. That's great. Do you have anything else to add to that? Um, yeah, I think I'll just add very quickly because I know we're probably short on time, but um, one of the things that uh, I've, we found is, you know, we've been focusing our emails a lot more about walking and biking and that's become so much more important to the community as a whole, not just, you know, our, our mailing list, our followers, but um, the community. It's like you go out at 6 p.m. and there's, there's tons of people walking in the neighborhood and or biking and so we've been really focusing on that in our communication uh, with our support with our members and really talking about you know better healthier ways to walk you know local trails that you can go to local bike rides you can go to you know it's like local hikes and i mean just kind of in in your local neighborhood even just kind of if you walk out the street and that's been really well received so we're seeing actually very good open rates very good click through rates and we're getting feedback from uh, people that they read the articles and they really enjoyed them and they applied them right away um, so it has created a different kind of engagement um, you know less in person but still uh, we're able to to have a, a continuous uh, communication with our with our members um, which has been really good that's great. Um, and so in light of the fact, and we see in the chat, a lot of cities are moving towards keeping these um, meetings available on a virtual platform. Do you have, and I'll start with Erica, um, any other recommendations or steps that you're taking to continue to make the engagement process equitable? Um, yeah, I would say, I, I think in terms of, of ensuring, yeah, that the process is, is accessible to folks who probably have like the limited, you know, are the least amount of options when it comes to technology. Um, I think just trying to make sure that the meetings work well on phones. What we know is most people have um, smartphones. So that's, you know, there's pretty widespread access to that. So there, I think there are ways in Zoom to make sure that it's working as best as possible on the phone. Uh, what I've been learning so far is there are so many different, um, different like functions with Zoom and actually Zoom as a, as a company is, is continuing to like improve their software and update it and stuff. So I think 
really getting as proficient in Zoom as possible to make sure that this is really accessible to folks who are accessing it by phone. I think that, you know, in order to make the virtual meetings, um, in order to provide translation services, that that requires quite a bit. Um, you need to have simultaneous translation and to do that, you really got to plan for it and have your system in place. So I just encourage folks to, to look at all of sort of our like uh, advice and directions sort of in our toolkit, but also to do your research. Uh, there's a lot of steps you need to take. And then um, just making sure you're, you're, you're doing everything that's needed to make it accessible for folks with disabilities. There's also a lot there around closed captioning, around screen readers, et cetera. Um, you wanna make sure that's all in place. So um, I think, you know, again, and, and I would highly encourage folks who might not have partnerships with community groups to start reaching out and talking to them because those folks know like what, how to really improve access for the residents that they work with. And a lot of times they're like folks are continually sort of improving or um, basically understanding more and more like what are what are best practices. So like, you know, we want to continue to learn um, what people are doing to address all of these issues so that we can continue to update our toolkit. But I would just encourage like to reach out to folks like Lalo and other community groups that are in your area because they know, you know, oh, like if this group provided tablets and we know that these folks, we want to make sure that these folks know about the meeting so that they're going to join, um, things like that. Uh, and so Lalo, do you have any other uh, examples of tools that you're using um, for accessing people that don't have access to technology? Yeah, um, I mean, we mostly, all our young people, we saw that they all have access to technology. So a lot of it, the first time was like doing phone calls, couldn't really depend on people having Wi-Fi. So just making sure that we are doing phone calls. Um, we realized that, you know, some families maybe did not have such fast, like, you know, um, data or bandwidth in their home. So connecting them to some programs that were happening, like Spectrum was having a couple of specials. So redoing that outreach and connection and, you know, um, connecting with parents or just, you know, connecting with young people and letting them know about these resources. So that way they can then connect with their family members or like with their own household. Um, that way it's possible. Other things were like, you know, for, for homes that, you know, did not want Wi-Fi but still needed it was like the Half Moon Bay Library was was renting out hotspots for extended time. So also, you know, um, with young people, you know, doing the process with them, the application with them, that way we're not just saying like, oh, here, go do this, but we're actually taking the steps um, with them. That way, you know, we're guaranteeing that they're they're filling it out. Um, and then that way their household is now equipped with, with hotspots. So um, yeah, just being informed about, you know, the resources in the community and also just doing like cold calls and, and phone calls and, and connecting with the families and the young people. Um, one question I have for all of you, and I'll start with um, my walk by Cupertino folks, is have you um, started changing the way that you share or collect people's contact information and data, you know, in light of the fact that there is no more um, in-person interaction? So uh, has, have people reached out to you asking for, you know, mailing lists or, or ideas? Like a lot of the questions here in the um, chat refer to, well, how do I find these people? How do I get in touch with this new group of people? So have you guys had any any requests like that or new tactics you use to share data? Well, we, we've we never shared or sold or anything, any of our, our email, uh, any of our personal data whatsoever on anybody. So um, even if we got requests, <laughs> we actually just say we don't do that. Um, so, because that's that's very important, obviously, to, to most people to make sure that that whatever they provide is not um, not going to be shared, or you know, they're not going to end up on a mailing on someone mail someone's mailing list that they didn't expect to. And of course, we always allow them to opt out of any of our mailings whenever they want, very simply um, with an unsubscribe button. So we, we want to make it we want to be as transparent and as clear about what we're providing, and um, and give them uh, again logical, consistent, factual information. And that's also treating them appropriately, which is treating their, their data as I would treat, treat my own. So um, we have always um, had a focus on online things, uh, such as 
we, our petition was online and in person. Uh, we always made sure that we try to make it as accessible as possible to those that perhaps couldn't, couldn't go to a park or something like that, but still wanted to support what was going on. So um, I think maybe we've lost some of the channels of the in-person, but we haven't needed too much to expand the ones we already had because we were already in that sphere. Um, how about you, Seema? What do, you, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, so we are a resident group. We're not a nonprofit. We're not a, you know, we're a resident group formed of residents, uh, all volunteers. No one's getting paid. There's no formal structure. Um, and, and yeah, so as Jennifer said, we're very protective of our mailing list. Uh, we don't endorse uh, political candidates. You know, it's like we, we try and be as neutral as we can. Um, so we send out a survey once uh, every election cycle to you know, see what the candidates' positions are on walking and biking. And then we publish that and we let our readers decide for themselves who they think they want to support. Um, if somebody wants uh, to reach our membership, um, you know, we'll talk to you. And if it's relevant to our membership, we will include your information in our, you know, in our communications. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to reach out to us and, and talk to us and see if this is something that, you know, we think would be relevant to our membership and, and you know, we're, we're happy to talk about that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we try and really, we're, we're very focused on creating a healthier, livable, you know, city with uh, lots of nature, walking and biking opportunities for our residents, and that's really our focus. That's really, really great advice, Seema. Um, I think that now more than ever, uh, organizations need to open lines of communication amongst their leadership in order to keep their constituents and their, their interested parties connected. So um, thanks for, for um, mentioning that strategy that you guys use. Um, we just have a few minutes left. I did want to highlight uh, something I forgot to mention, which is that Jen Sheeran is our um, Bike Summit uh, 2020 Person of the Year. So Jen, congrats to you. Um, and we've really enjoyed listening to you guys talk about Seema and Jen, your pre-COVID success in, uh, the, in your trail project, and then Lalo and Erica, uh, the strategy that you, you're using to um, measure health outcomes, Erica, and, and keep track of that in San Mateo County, and Lalo, your efforts to keep the youth engaged. I do want to plug um, the next session after lunch is about equity. So if you want to hear more about uh, equity um, in Safe Routes to School, which I'm sure you can translate to other projects, uh, please tune in to that session uh, later. And uh, don't forget to please visit the, the poster sessions, which uh, we do have one about um, kind of what we call the old school engagement methods. So um, if no one else has anything else, we'll, we'll wrap up. Can, What's I, that? Can, I do a, can I do a shameless plug also for just please quick. do <laughs> um, so we are not done on the Ragnar Creek Trail we have another vote and hopefully final vote coming up in probably around October so um, we are still you know this is it's going to be another contentious vote so any and all uh, parties who are on this call who would like to dial in and offer your support at the october vote we would welcome you with open arms um, if you need any details please ping either me or jennifer and we'll uh, add you to our mailing list and we will keep you informed all right <laughs> well thanks everyone for tuning in um i think it's lunchtime so we'll see you in a little bit Right. And I'm going to chime in here. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a great panel. Um, we are now going to highlight our award winners this year before we break up into our uh, lunch tables for some networking. Uh, I also wanted to underscore what you just reminded folks about, Jennifer, and that is that this year, along with the sessions, we're showcasing posters submitted by participants on key issues uh, and innovative ideas related to biking. The topics range from uh, computer games to explore street changes to the need to prioritize uh, bike infrastructure for women. So you can go to the summit webpage, uh, comment, ask questions, and get connected to our poster uh, presenters. Also, I wanted to remind folks, if you haven't yet changed your name or the formatting of how you appear, we'd love it if you could uh, change it to first name, last name, and then parentheses for how you identify yourself along with if you, if you want to uh, include your pronouns. Uh, and you can do that by um, hovering above your picture and clicking on the three dots to change your name there. So with that business uh, behind us, 
Uh, we are going to go ahead and announce our summit winners. Oh, and my, hold on one sec. Uh, there we go. Um, all right, we're going to uh, start. So each year we select our awardees based on nominations that you all submit. Uh, and this year we had 200 people that participated in both nominating and voting on our awardees. So let's go ahead and meet them. First, uh, we're going to talk about our Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, our Lifetime Achievement Award honors and recognizes longtime SVBC member and volunteer, Virginia Panlasigi, who passed away earlier this year. Uh, Virginia started biking as a child through helping her brother with his San Jose Mercury newspaper route on Stingray bikes. How many of us remember having newspaper routes? And I wonder how important newspaper routes are to uh, facilitating a pro bike community. Uh, but we can talk about that at another time. Virginia continued to ride after starting her own family, riding a tandem with a trailer bike attached to it so she could ride with her 10 year old son and five year old daughter. She was an avid bike commuter, enthusiast, and deeply devoted leader in our bike community. Uh, her legacy will never be forgotten. Uh, Virginia, you are very dearly missed and may you rest in peace. I know um, many, many folks uh, at SVBC adored Virginia. She was one of our stalwart volunteers. If you parked your bike with uh, SVBC, you most likely met Virginia. Uh, she was wonderful. So thank you, Virginia. Uh, she is our Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Next up, and we had a little bit of foreshadowing about this, Jennifer Sheeran, board member with Walk Bike Cupertino. And you only just heard a little bit of the, of the battles that have been going on in Cupertino. And I feel like you guys downplayed them a little bit. Uh, but Jennifer is a key leader who orchestrated a coalition of supporters over the span of a few years in Cupertino to make the Regnart Trail possible despite intense opposition from neighbors adjacent to the proposed trail and a skeptical city council. She inspired residents to show up for multiple public forums, many of which were marathon public hearings. You heard her mention one that went to 4.30 a.m. Uh, and she also serves on the Cupertino Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission. She's, as I mentioned, on the board of Walk by Cupertino and uh, participates with the Cupertino Safe Routes to School Working Group. We did a, we being SVBC, we do these infrastructure rides where we uh, bring different city staff and city council members to different cities to learn about their projects. And when we did one in Cupertino, um, maybe a year or a year and a half ago, we went to look at where this trail could go. And this was pre-vote. And um, this is the part you guys didn't mention. I don't think you did, um, but there were signs up on people's uh, front, front lawns with a circle, a red circle and a slash through it saying, no, we don't want a trail here. And um, that, that was the kind of opposition that um, Jennifer and, and Walk Bike Cupertino had faced and have so far overcome. And so we'll, we'll keep working on that. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, moving on to program of the year, it's Bicycling with an exclamation mark. Uh, this program aims at keeping our roads clean by picking up trash on the side of the road, it's led by Rick Denman and with the support of many bicyclists that take the time and energy to pick up trash along our roads. The group has ridden all over and up the hills around the peninsula to tackle trash, big and small. Rick's passion project for Bicycling is truly contagious and the impact he has had on our beautiful area is clearly visible for everyone to see. So that is um, Bicycling. So thank you to Rick. And then last up, we want to talk about the project of the year, and that is daily the Daily City Vision Zero Action Plan. So in the spring of 2020, the Daily City City Council approved the Vision Zero Action Plan. It is special since, and listen to this because there are first here, 
It is the very first plan of its kind in San Mateo County. So kudos to Daly City. Uh, so Daly City's goal is to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries by 2035 through safety focused transportation projects and programs. And this goes back to what um, the Caltrans director this morning was talking about 10 deaths in California um, a day on, on our roads. And just, I think what struck me about what he said was how numb we've become to that. We just accept that people die and get injured on our roads. And so uh, thank you to Daly City for taking that very seriously. Uh, the Daily City Vision Zero plan adopts the safe system approach, which prioritizes human life and health as the first consideration in transportation system planning and decision making. I, I just want to say that again, because I think it's, it seems so obvious, but it's still revolutionary here that it is prior, their plan is prioritizing human life and health as the first consideration in transportation system planning and decision making. This includes safe streets, safe speeds, safe people, safe vehicles, and post-crash care. So thank you to Daly City. A hearty congratulations to all our award winners. Um, and all of our award winners are present with us at this time, so feel free to chat with them to know more about their work. Uh, special thanks to Farron Peers for the design expertise for the Summit Award presentation images. So at this point, we are going to break for lunch and break you all up into uh, little lunch tables so you can network and chat amongst each other. Um, and this is randomized and we have some questions that will appear in the chat box that you can use as prompts if you find that all of you are sitting there in silence and you need some sort of prompt. So with that, um, I will say let's go ahead and break for lunch. Thank you. And we'll see you back at 1 p.m. Thanks, sir. Show me what to do here.